On today's show, we'll be joined by Ali Khan Bijani, our weekly co-host here at Locked on Rockets, to discuss a lot of different things. First off, the Houston Rockets making a trade at the tail end of September. Eight-player trade that effectively boils down to not a whole lot, but it's still a good trade and still a very creative trade by general manager Rafael Stone. We're going to talk about that. We'll also talk about takeaways from day three of Houston Rockets training camp. Steven Silas dropping a lot of gems, a lot to break down, both in regards to Jabari Smith Jr. and his defensive impact for this Houston Rockets team, as well as some changes potentially to the Houston Rockets offense. All of that and more can be up right here at Locked on Rockets. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. The Houston Rockets select Jalen Green and Jabari Smith Jr. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. Every time I step on that floor, I'm coming. You're getting somebody who's going to come in with a chip on their shoulder, somebody who's going to come come in and compete from day one. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What's up and welcome to another edition of Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and credentialed media member. I'm also the host of Locked on NBA Mondays, host of the State of the Rockets podcast, as well as Rockets Watch. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin and the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets. Free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. Now, Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, it's where the game starts. Joining us now, as he does each and every week, is none other than our weekly co host, Ali Khan Bijani, the X's and O's man himself. And he joins us on a day where we have a trade to talk about, of all things to happen. At the end of September, training camp is officially wrapped up. We're going to talk all about training camp day three. Some absolute gems coming out of Jay Sean Tate, Steven Siles. We have a lot to break down, so much to discuss. But right here at the top, we have to discuss the fact that the Houston Rockets and the Oklahoma City Thunder have orchestrated a trade centered around eight players. Uh, and th- this Superstar was one of the most- trade, man. This is a blockbuster. Yeah, this was th- this. Uh, you know what? This certainly was. A trade. No, uh, the Thunder are sending to the Houston Rockets Derek Favors, Ty Jerome, Mo Harkless, and Theo Maladon, and a 2025 second round pick via the Atlanta Hawks. The Rockets are sending out David Nwaba, Sterling Brown, Trey Burke, and Marquise Chris. So obviously, Marquise Chris, Trey Burke, leftovers, holdovers from the Christian Wood trade, as well as Sterling Brown making his second stint with the Houston Rockets. Very, very short lived second stint. David Nwaba, who has been living at the end of the Rockets bench, really not doing much of anything of note here in Houston. Uh, All of those guys being packaged and sent out. Now, the the framework, the structure of this deal, as I understand it, is basically the Thunder were looking to get away from the luxury tax. They were right on the precipice of being at the luxury tax threshold. So this saves them some money, gives them some breathing room to where they don't accidentally dip into the luxury tax based on further subsequent moves. The Thunder essentially pay the Rockets with a second-round draft pick to uh, unload some of the salary. Not only that... Uh, I also know for a fact that the Houston Rockets are being paid $6.3 million in cash allotment, cash considerations from the OKC Thunder to facilitate this deal because there was about, give or take, a a $7.2 million difference in the salaries coming back to Houston and the outgoing salaries of the Rockets players. So the Thunder are making up that difference by including those cash considerations. So the Rockets are effectively paying $1 million dollars in, in the difference in traded salaries for a future second round draft pick. The draft pick, of course, uh, it is protected 31 through 40. So not terrible protections. Um, and if those protections do not, or if those protections actually do take place, if the Atlanta Hawks somehow land in the 31 through 40 range on that secondary, a second round draft pick, then the pick moves over to the subsequent year, the 2026 draft, and it winds up being the best pick between the... Let me double check on this. I want to make sure I have it right. Where's the conveyor on this? Oh, I lost it. I believe it's the Philadelphia 76ers, Dallas Mavericks, or... And there's one more team in here that it didn't make it into my notes, and I'm mad that it didn't. Well... But there's some protections on it, essentially. There are some protections on it, and that's what we're going to go with. And that's 
basically the trade. So the Rockets paid a million dollars to get a future second round draft pick. And it's worth noting that Derek Favors is basically an upgraded version of what David Nwaba is in the sense that David Nwaba was a $5 million expiring contract. Now Derek Favors is a 10-ish million dollar expiring contract. And so that is a much easier salary as far as moving, potentially aggregating, doing stuff with at the trade deadline. It's an expiring contract or potentially, Alicon, they could get creative with it, right? I think they could potentially aggregate Eric Gordon and um, Derek Favors' salary, get up to around 20, 30 something million dollars and get themselves involved in a, a deal that probably takes back on a contract and get some picks. Because right now, if you're the Rockets, you're just trying to get assets. You're trying to get more first round picks as much as you can because you're trying to get yourself in a situation where after 2024, you don't have multiple first round picks each year. You maybe have only one each uh, each season. So you want to make sure that you're trying to get as many first round picks, hard currency that you can uh, to be able to make moves as your roster gets older, better, stronger in a situation where you may need to cash in to bring in some additional pieces if you're in the playoffs and trying to make a run. Yeah, and so that that absolutely is is something that they could utilize Derek Favors for, you know, basically making him a salary ballast. Uh, it remains to be seen. I mean, maybe he gets some burn in a Rockets jersey. I, I don't, I don't really see that happening. I don't expect him to be a, a piece of this team or somebody who's getting minutes in the rotation. I just, I just don't see that uh, yeah. becoming a possibility. But. That's that's it for the trade. It's it's a trade. It happened. It, ultimately, in the grand scheme of things, it's not Bo a bon super is still blockbuster here. That's important. deal. Yeah, that is that is important. Boban is here. Boban is here to stay, and that's what matters. But what else matters is Jabari Smith Jr.'s defense and how incredible. But Jay Sean Tate is raving about it. Steven Silas is raving about it. His defense. We've seen clips of it. I've seen it in person. Jabari is so fantastic on that end of the floor, and. I want to play back a clip of Jay Sean Tate kind of praising Jabari's defense from Rockets training camp day three. What does having a guy like Jabari out there on the floor allow you guys to maybe do a bit different defensively compared to last season? I mean, Jabari, I mean, you got to see with his length and um, his ability to just alter shots and, and be in the right spot. And he's a guy who actually wants to play defense. You know, it's hard to find guys, you know, nowadays that love the defensive end. That's one thing me and him have conversations about all the time is um, he's asking questions of how to learn and where the spots, you know, and um, he's he's a very fast learner. He's taking everything I'm giving him and you see him putting it in uh, that day or the next day. So. so Jay Sean Tate with some very, very high praise for Jabari's defense. And I think the thing that really stood out, right, is he said he's a guy who actually Actually wants to play defense, right? To me, that almost feels like maybe a little bit of a subtweet of uh, a former Houston Rocket, one Christian Wood, a guy who probably doesn't enjoy playing too much defense uh, in his downtime. But just the idea, right, that Jabari is trying to absorb and learn so much, really, really hanging his hat on the defensive side of the floor is a really exciting thing. You know, there's a few plays that are going viral, Jackson. You know, you know what I'm talking about, Jackson? You were there. Oh, I, yeah, I, I do know what you're talking about. And we're going we're gonna to get we're gonna get into those plays that are going viral. We're going to talk about Jabari Smith Jr. shutting down both Jalen Green and Kevin Porter Jr. in Rockets practice at day three of training camp. We're going to get there in just a moment after a quick message from our friends over at Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your football betting info this season. Find all the latest player developments, leagues, matchups, news, podcasts, in-depth articles, analysis, every single game you can find all over at BetOnline. As always, BetOnline.net remains your continued source for all of your sports wagering information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there right now, you can take a look at who the odds on favorites are to win the title this year in the NBA. Right now, the Golden State Warriors... Ugh, Leading the way at plus 575. You got the Boston Celtics at plus 600 in second place. Milwaukee Bucks holding it down in third place at plus 700. And then rounding out the top five odds makers for this year's title favorites, the Brooklyn Nets and the LA Clippers at plus 750 apiece. So for all that and more odds, head over to betonline.net to learn more about the trends in action available to you. BetOnline, it's where the game starts. And continuing on here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, I, you know what? I should have I should have changed the rejoin music, Alicon, because it, 
a little birdie told me that somebody had a birthday earlier this week. How, how was your birthday, man? It was good, man. Thank you. Thank you, Jackson. Um, it was good. One year older, um, which means that I'm one year older than all the rookies on the Rockets team. You know, there used to be a time, Jackson, where I was the youngest person in the locker room when I used to walk in there. And that, that is definitely not the case anymore. Um, no, man, it's it's a blessing to be able to see another year. And um, hopefully all of us, all the listeners, Jackson, you know, all of us have good, long, healthy lives. So it's it's a blessing. I thank God for it. And yeah, it was good. I got a few good gifts, though. Um, so Ooh. if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it. But for those listening, so I was a big fan of Steve Nash growing up. And so my brother got me um, a Steve Nash classic vintage jersey um, or a T-shirt jersey. It's really nice. Um, and then an, another special person got me this dust bead, which is like a prayer a bead uh, uh, for prayer. And honestly, it's one of the nicest gifts when he's given me. It's it's a beautiful thing. It's on the mic. So if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it. But if not, it's like this brown wooden type of dust bead. It's prayer bracelet. It's really good. Um, means a lot to me. Both people who got this gift to me means a lot to me. So just want to give a shout out to them and shout out to you, Jackson, um, for everything you've done for me, man. So it was good. It was a good week. But well, I don't appreciate what you called me earlier with the orange Suns jersey I'm wearing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he look with the with the pullover Suns, you know, t shirt jersey. You look a little bit like the Suns mascot, like the gorilla. Like all well, you I need am is a gorilla mask. Black full sleeve underneath it, but uh, you know, I hey man, I actually got to see him live. I went to the Sixers Suns game earlier last uh, last season when they played in Phoenix. That mascot is funny, man. Like I thought, I thought, I thought Clutch was good. Clutch is still the goat, right? Clutch is the goat, but. The Phoenix Gorilla mascot, he's he's hilarious, man. Or she's hilarious, whoever's in the in the suit. It, it's okay. It's okay. We're 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 pronoun inclusive here, so we're gonna say they're hilarious. They're, um, yes. Thank yeah, you there for we go. Thank you. But um also, yeah, clutch clears, absolutely. Goat mascot. But what we are excited to talk about is Jabari Smith Jr.'s defense, the takeaways that we have from day three of Rockets training camp. Before we get to that, though, we, we want to talk about I don't have another ad. Sorry, that was a terrible tease. Um, I want to share what Steven Silas had to say about Jabari Smith Jr.'s defense. Having a guy like Jabari with his gifts allow you to do defensively that's maybe a little bit different than last season. <laughs> Did you see? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean... His switchability is really good. His basketball instincts on the defensive end, he's in the gaps like I was talking about. There were some penetration plays where he was just like standing there and he's so long that the gaps are not available. But the effort that he gives defensively are just, it, it is something that carries over to his teammates. So um, playing a little bit harder defensively because he's on the floor, um, being in the gaps a little bit more because he has the length and then having someone out there that really loves to play defense is a, is a big thing for us. Two things here from Silas stood out to me, Ali Khan, and the first of which is him saying, right, Jabari being out there, right, he, he makes his teammates better because he's playing hard, right? He yeah. elevates the play of his teammates for sure. defensively, and I think that that's a big part of, of what stood out. The other part was him talking about gaps right and if you're watching on youtube you can even see steven silas kind of got into it was funny he got into like a full-blown defensive stance like right in front of us during the media scrum just put his arms out to his side and everything and there was that photo that kind of circulated from the the houston rockets uh social media accounts right before they went to summer league right it, it was the you know they did a handful of practices at toyota center with all the new guys and there was that photo of jabari where he was spread out full-blown defensive stance on the rockets practice court and he's like occupying like a third of the floor because he's so long he takes up so much space defensively and Silas highlighted that fact, talking about he closes off the gaps using his length. And that's a topic that, uh, uh, you know, that you brought up here a lot is talking about gaps defensively. Yeah. So when we're, when we're considering gaps with a team defense, right, it, especially at the top of the key, you're trying to take away driving lanes. You're taking away passing lanes as well. And I want to highlight there's a viral video going around that our boy Jackson also put up um, that that looks at Jalen Green coming off a double stagger on the left side. So the double stagger was sent by Alperin, Shangun, and KJ Martin. Okay. And Jalen Green goes from the baseline, I mean, from the corner to the top of the key. Jabari switches on to Jalen and then he gets into a stance. And when he gets into a stance, Jalen's like, I want to drive right. 
Jabari's inching to the right, so he takes away that. And then he's so long, he takes away the left. So Jalen is trying his best to kind of dance. And if you watch the clip, if you go back and you watch this viral clip, you'll notice how Jalen has to extend himself a little bit more of an arc around the key then to be able to get in the paint. But even then, he still doesn't have separation from Jabari. Jabari gets a, shot, a hand up, deters a shot, doesn't even hit the rim. It goes over the rim. And that just kind of tells you and shows you how good Jabari is at kind of taking away a gap of the floor. If you're taking away, like think of it as if you're in the NFL, you have a nose tackle. You like to play that A gap, right? That center gap. And in, in terms of Jabari, in this case, he's playing that middle of the floor. If you switch and you go in the middle, try to get an advantage, he takes away the entire middle. You have to go right or left. But what does that do in the Rockets' new emphasis on helping and be more aggressive with their help in terms of getting into the body of the offensive player? It, it makes it tougher, ideally, schematically, if it goes right, to be able to get past the on-ball pressure, the point of attack defense. And as of right now, I mean, Jabari is showing you the complete package defensively. Jackson, you've been there. You were there in Lake Charles all three days. Tell us, how good has he been in the scrimmage time you've seen just occupying space with his wingspan and making it up? I mean, if you go back and watch that Jalen clip I was just referencing, on that switch where he was making to Jalen, he was at the free throw line. He wasn't even at the top of the key when Jalen got to the top of the key. Jabari used his hands, put his right hand up, had his body in position to, to, to take away a drive to the right and close up the space in less than a second. I mean, it's incredible. It allows you to do so many versatile things defensively. Like we talked about many shows ago, NBA defenses are going towards a hybrid man-to-man -man kind of zone situation. The Rockets are not there yet. They're a young team. They're going to institute basic principles first. But with Jabari, you could just see the vision. A guy who not is an anchor in terms of paint protection, but an anchor because he can close off an entire area of the court just because of his ability to lock down a perimeter player. Yeah, I, th I think we, you know, the term defensive anchor gets so often, you know, ta tagged with guys like, you know, a Joel Embiid or maybe a Jarrett Allen or a Rudy Gobert or somebody who is, you know, this big monstrous force who's just, you know, closing off all, all the driving lanes right in and around the rim. It, it kind of that interior type protection. I think Jabari is going to be a defensive anchor, but in a different kind of yes. you know standpoint is the fact that he is going to be somebody who just changes the overall scheme of a defense, much like again a Giannis and Tedokounmpo type. Good like example. That's the We're type not comparing them. Anchor. Though. We're not comparing them. We're just in terms of who they are as players. We're comparing them in terms of type of, type of impact that they can Correct. make defensively. Right, Jackson. Absolutely correct. And I appreciate you for clarifying that point. Absolutely. Because I don't want somebody to misaggregate me and say that Jabari is the next Giannis. No, that's, I mean, that's, you, you dropped the sources earlier today um, with the six point three million dollars. So, I mean, my, my guy's getting sources. He's about to start getting aggregated more. You know what I mean? If I start getting aggregated, get me out of here. No, pack <laughs> me up. No. All right. Um, and, and I will say um of the two viral clips, I appreciate you trying to give me credit, but that was Jonathan Fagan's clip with it. Oh, viral. Okay. The, the, the Jalen play. OG, OG I, Fagan. Sorry, OG sorry, Fagan, Jonathan. who was just on this podcast. It was a great show. Go check it out if you haven't yet. Um, but I had the clip of KPJ. And so KPJ was trying to drive on Jabari Smith. Jabari got switched on to KPJ. And what stood out to me about that is Jabari switched with purpose. And that's something that is so important to do, right? He didn't just switch just for the sake of switching. It wasn't just guys passing off lazy. the offensive play. Yeah, he, he switched and he jumped out on the switch at KPJ. Made him uncomfortable got with the ball in his face. hands. He crowded him that way. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Forced a very difficult drive. KPJ chicken winged on the drive too. He, <laughs> he pushed Jabari off of him. It would have been whistled an offensive foul eight out of 10 times, guaranteed. And, and KPJ got to his kind of like, you know, pseudo mid-range fadeaway, whatever, the shot that I've belly ached about all of last season saying it's a terrible shot, but that's all KPJ could get. And even still, Jabari was able to sort of kind of recover, maybe get back into the picture and get a hand up. Wasn't a full-blown contest, but even though he got chicken winged off, he was still fighting to get back in the play, managed to secure the rebound, and then got the outlet pass to a breakaway Tari Eason for he an easy the slam break. on the other end. He led the break until the half court, then made that nice bounce yep. pass. And Tari was wide open for the slam. That was beautiful.
And that was something we saw him do in, in Summer League, whereas he, he wouldn't be afraid to put the ball on the floor for a dribble or two while kind of surveying the open court and trying to make that right read, right? That right kick ahead pass in transition. And the way that the Houston Rockets want to play offensively, they want to shore up their defense so that they can not be the worst team in the association in defense, right? Be a better defensive team to then generate those transition opportunities, right? And if Jabari can be that defensive anchor, somebody who's going to change the complexion of your defense and also be adept at securing a rebound and then also getting it out to your two athletic guards in Kevin Porter Jr. and Jalen Green, this team's going to be exciting and fun to watch. I'm telling you, man, the, the sky is the limit for these guys. Yeah, I I wonder I wonder how quickly Jabari will grow in that role of being a defensive type of like right now. I mean, we, we think of him as a guy who's developing offensively, just defensively, though, a guy who can make a consistent impact. That's what this team has been waiting for. Absolutely, and I think we're going to see that impact very, very quickly once we are back to Houston Rockets basketball, which starts this Sunday. We are two days away from Houston Rockets basketball. It is such an exciting time. Rockets versus Spurs Sunday night. Of course, we're going to be covered for the reaction, the post game, all of that here on this episode or here on this podcast, I should say. Coming up, we do want to talk a little bit about Jabari Smith Jr.'s offense, though, as well as. The Rockets offense and how certain guys factor in. What does Alper and Shingun's role look like next season? What does the actual offense look like? And is Steven Silas going to deviate from what has been largely a five-out system during New his time scheme? as the Houston Rockets head coach? New what? scheme! We're going to talk about it in just one moment. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Now, we had... Again, a lot of gems come out of training camp day three for the Houston Rockets and probably maybe the biggest one. I, as excited as I am about all the praise and the hype surrounding Jabari Smith Jr.'s defense, Ali Khan, the biggest one may be a change to the Rockets' offensive scheme for this next season. Let's hear what Steven Silas had to say about it. Yeah, we have some work to do for sure. We're kind of going out. We're starting five out and we're going out, going into going into four, four out, one in, and that's new for us. So I don't know, well, the tape's not still down, but getting to those spots is new for us. So we're doing a lot of drilling along, along those lines. But yeah, the paint here, the court I think is the same, but the paint is so tight that the help spots and the spacing spots are different. So um, overall, just okay. But for day three, um, about what I expected. Even with the four out, one in, are there things that you want Al B to do in terms of he doesn't have the ball being like slot of the wing? Like, is there any specific things you want him to do? Yeah, yeah. Well, I want him to roll and pick and roll, and I want us to look for him when he rolls. He's such a good playmaker, and like being static when we're making plays, when he's making plays, isn't great for our offense. So if he rolls and we can hit him on those short rolls, and now he's attacking the rim or he's making a play for a teammate or making those look to the corner, pass to the wing, or look to the wing, pass to the corner, those plays, that's what we're trying to get him to do. Once we're four out, one in, so he is in the dunker or he is, he's reading penetration. So if the drive goes baseline, he's trying to front the rim, the drive goes middle, he's circling underneath. But we also haven't even put in our post-up package yet. So our four out, one in spacing when he's in the post, that'll be the next layer that we haven't even gotten to yet. You've mentioned that a couple times now, saying the word static in regards to LP. Is that talking about him being static or the players around the him being static? The players around him being start static, kind of just like, okay, here's the set play. Here we go. We're going to get LP at the elbow and it's, we're walking the ball up the floor or we're going to get LP in the post. We're walking the ball up the floor where he's catching it more on the move everybody else is kind of doing their thing and spacing correctly but i don't want him just catching and everybody standing and watching him i want him kind of catching on the move because he does he, his basketball instincts are so good that um him kind of just standing still takes away one of the advantages that he has as far as catching and making a play as opposed to defense kind of being more set a lot to unpack there. That's probably, I think, in all-time LOR history, that might be one of the longest, like, individual clips that I've run. I've run, like, full-blown interviews before with, like, five to six minutes of, like, 
just straight footage, but I don't think I've ever run a clip that long because it was all so inter it all it was all intertwined, right? Kelly had a great follow-up question, and that was the second time that Steven Silas had used the word static when describing Alperin Shingun and his role within the Rockets offense. And so I wanted to know more about what that was. Alika, where do you want to start unpacking all of that? Because there's so much to take away from what Steven Silas just gave us. What's interesting to me is that he wants Alperin Shingun on the move. And on the move, Jackson can mean different things. I mean, you were there in training camp. We watched him in EuroLeague. Can you share with us, like, what do you what do you see when he's on the move? What does that What does that entail? I think Alper and Shingun on the move, and we we saw this a little bit with his play in Eurobasket. Is there were like some you know possessions where he was uh, you know received the you know a pass from the you know out of bounds play, but he was on the move and was able to attack a defense rather than getting to his kind of traditional like oh he's just got the ball like on the low block or he's facing up and trying to attack that way. I. I I think that getting the ball on the move to Alpi allows him, right, the opportunities, maybe like getting him kind of pick and roll, getting him in this short roll, and then having him be that decision maker, that secondary decision maker within the offense. If you've got two driving forces like a Kevin Porter Jr. and a Jalen Green who can initiate the pick and roll, we know that Alpi is a great screener, but what we didn't really see a lot of last season was them really getting a heavy dosage of those pick and roll possessions to where then LP could be the decision maker in the middle of the floor, right? If he catches the ball on the, you know, on the roll towards the rim, he can either create his own shot and, and finish strong at the rim. He can read the defense and see what's happening and make those kickout passes, right? Make those reads to the corners or out to the wing, wherever, because we know he's got that level of vision. So rat, like Steven Silas said, rather than it being a static, like, Oh, we're just going to give the ball to LP and then, Guys are going to stand around and kind of wait for him to do something with it. It's getting him the ball and the move so that the defense is already in flux and then letting him capitalize on that. You know, one one interesting thing that's not being talked about enough with this is that this allows you to play Jay Shantae and Alper and Shangun together. And there's something interesting that Steven Sells mentioned today in the media availability. Um, on the last day of training camp, he talked about the dunker spot and how a, in a four out one in offense, Usually it's it's like we we consider four out one in like the, the Philadelphia 76ers offense. You got four guys, two in the corner, two in the slot. That's usually how it works in a four out one in offense. You have two one shooter on either uh, both corners, all right, left corner, right corner. Then you got the right and left slot, right? That which is that wing area. You put two shooters there. Then you have a player in the post who's trying to get the ball and establish himself. I think in this case, Jay Sean Tate being in the dunker spot is something that I've been asking for. I know other Rockets fans have been asking for for a while. Just allows you to do a lot of different things especially when they're playing certain defenses against you, putting a center on Jay Sean or doing all these different things. So that's one thing. It allows you to kind of do that. And when you're, whenever you are Alper and Shangun and you're getting the ball in the move, it's not just because you set a screen and you roll on dribble handoffs. Why is that? So why was that so effective with Jalen green last year? Because he has a great first step. And so when he gets just even to the elbow or when he gets to the paint, he's going to automatically draw in two players. Now, if Alpi is on the move and he's rolling, he's not he's not at the perimeter, he's rolling, which puts in more pressure, he can get the ball. And if they collapse on him, he already knows how to be able to manipulate a defense with his eyes and make the pass to the correct corner or the correct slot. And that's what I'm eager to see. It's not about Jalen or KPJ. And it's not about Alpi being able to get the ball on the move. It's about what he does after the move. Because a lot of players can get the ball on the move after Jalen and KPJ initiated it. But can they draw on a third defender? And if you draw on a third defender, that puts a defense in a scramble. And most defenses in the league, every single possession, will not be able to cover all shooters on the perimeter. And the way Alpi passes the ball into the pocket of the shooter's hand, into the pocket of the shooter to get into an immediate gather, that's going to help this Rockets team a lot, especially if you surround him in those lineups with capable shooting. The, uh, the other thing of what Steven Silas said is he mentioned the fact that they haven't even layered in the idea of the, the post play, right? Running the offense through Alper and Shingun down low. And yeah. I, I think that's kind of like a... I think it's smart that they're not trying to throw too much at these guys too quickly, right? It's, we're talking about three days worth of training camp. But at the same time, it does kind of feel like last season... Guys didn't know how to play with Alpi. They weren't accustomed to having 
an old school, traditional, like back to the basket, low post scoring presence. Yeah. And that is what led to a lot of static offense when Alpi was on the floor where he would get the rock down low and start making his moves. And everybody's just standing around the three point line, like waiting for something to happen. There was no off ball movement. There were, were no back screens happening to maybe get a backdoor cut towards the rim or like a flare screen to open up a three point shooter. We saw Turkey do some of those things. We saw the Turkish national team utilize all off-ball movement when LP got the ball down low to create opportunities for guys when LP was making his move because it either it leads to LP gets getting a bucket if they don't send help or if they do send help or maybe they lose their man whatever so I think that's a big part of at some point right and I, you know TBD on when they decide to start layering that into the offense but I do still want to see Alper and Shagoon have those opportunities to play his game, right? To get the ball in his yeah. sweet spots on the floor. And then again, maybe you free up, right? You have KPJ and Jalen Green setting some back picks for each other and free one up, one or the other up for some three pointers. Just, just a little bit of movement on the perimeter because if enough eyes are drifting over trying to see what Alp is doing, somebody can get open. And all you have to do is maybe drift, you know, five steps off to one direction. And Alp will find you in that window for a wide open shot. Yeah. And I, I think that's the key here with four out, one in. Because of just the, the how the defense plays those types of possessions and the necess necessity to space properly, if you see any specific defender cheating in a four out, one in offense, you are told to cut, make a back cut. You are told to take advantage of that overplay. And once that happens, that creates movement within itself. So that's one thing about four out one. And I think the basic principle, I think we'll see that once – Sunday comes around in these preseason games. You're right. The layered, I'm, I'm hoping to see layered offense from that perspective because the Rockets are so good at generating threes from out, out of that flare action. Even since D'Antoni era, even since Kevin McHale era, they're good at, you know, creating some open threes off a of flare action. But Al P is so good at being able to get to the, the middle of the, the paint and still score. The defense is now on scouting reports are going to send a second cheat defender. And if it's a four out one in offense, and if the Rockets can understand proper spacing and how to move and how to actually create optimal spacing around the perimeter, that's going to allow you to have some screens and uh, cuts so Alpi can make the pass. That's going to allow you to do some movement on the perimeter, whether it's setting a double screen and having a shooter come off a pin down, right? So it, there, there are a lot of options, but I think most importantly, what I heard from Steven Silas is that they haven't layered yet, but they will. And once they do, once they understand these basic principles, it's like they did their defense last season. And look at look at how much better Jalen got at the end of the season once he got a understanding of technique. I think it, we talk about technique on defense. There is understanding of technique and flow on offense. You have to understand your place and your role in the offense. Every single spot, you have to understand where to fill, where to move, where to do everything, right? And if you can understand those basic concepts, then you can add those layers and go from there. Because I know Steven Siles wants to add all these different things. You saw that in, you saw that in Dallas when he was there. But these players have to have a basic understanding of the actions in order to be able to go from it, go to the layers. Last thing I want to discuss here from day three of Rockets training camp is there was uh, the there were some clips running around. Uh, somebody from Rockets Twitter had a friend who was at the pra practice. It may have been a McNeese State basketball player, possibly don't know who specifically it was, but there were some clips circulating. And at one point there was a reported fact that the uh, the gray team was up 37 to 13 on the black team in the scrimmages. And that is 100% true. I snapped a score, a, a picture of the scoreboard and was able to verify that that was the score. And there were three, you know, premier players, if you will, on each team, three sides. Now they were cycling different players in and out of these lineups. But the three key players on each team, the gray team had Jabari Smith Jr., Tari Eason, and Eric Gordon. The black team had Kevin Porter Jr., Jalen Green, and Alperin Shingoon. And again, other diff different guys are being cycled in and out of both of these lineups, um, but those were kind of the three mainstay pieces for each team. And I saw some people that felt some kind of way about this on social media, talking about, oh my God, this is terrible. You know, Jalen, KPJ, and Alper are getting blown out. When you look at those the dichotomy of those two lineups, right? Those two three-man groups. One of those lineups is an insane defensive wrecking ball force with Jabari, Tari, and Eric Gordon. And one of them isn't with Jalen Green, 
Kevin Porter Jr. and Alper and Shingun. That's not to take anything away from them. My point is just those guys are offensive weapons, right? Jalen Green, KPJ, uh, Al P. So I don't think anybody should walk away from this like discouraged about Jalen Green or KPJ or Alper and Shingun. I think if anything, all you look at it is the amount of you should be encouraged. motivated, excited, and encouraged about what. Jabari and Tari and Eric Gordon were able to do from a defensive side of things, as well as taking advantage of the opportun- offensive opportunities that they had, which I will say one more chime in that I have. Dacia Nix looked really good. He had a couple really impressive finishes for the gray team at the rim. He had one and one that the entire gym erupted. He drove, broke somebody down off. He got, he caught it off the catch, attacked off the catch out of the right corner, drove in, was contested at the rim by Al P and went directly into Al P's body and finished. Didn't even kiss it off the glass. Just kind of like took the contact, the huge wow. hit and That's threw awesome. it over Al P's outstretched arms and one opportunity. So Not Dacian a question for Nick's you though, on Dacian. impressed. Got a question for you on Dacian. What is it? What you got? Is he your, in your eyes, obviously what we, we're going to see Sunday is he in your eyes, the current leader for backup point. Yeah, I, 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 I abs, you know, absolutely. I'm, and I feel confident in saying that Ty Ty Washington has, has looked good as well. And he's, he, Ty Ty's maybe a bit more versatile from a combo guard perspective because Dacian is a bit more of that traditional pure point, maybe not a pure point, but just he, he's an embodiment of that point guard role and doesn't necessarily have the comfortability playing off ball that, that Ty Ty does right now. But seeing the way that, Dacian's confidence is kind of coming out of him now and that he's more confident in his own abilities and the things that he can do on the basketball court. Seeing him have those finishes in practice, and again, I only saw a little bit of it, right? We, we got maybe 10 minutes of practice tops. Um, I think Dacian is is poised to have a really, really strong, strong year for the Houston Rockets. You know, just quickly before I know we're about to wrap up here, Jackson, what is a couple, what are some couple of things you're looking forward to on Sunday? I'm looking forward to seeing Jabari Smith's defense in action. I want to see how it looks, you know, in in a full 100% game setting. Um, And I'm curious to see how it looks when he's playing the four, right? We didn't really get to see that in summer league. He played the five pretty much exclusively because they didn't have Usman Garuba. So I'm curious to see how, where, you know, what space on the floor he occupies, um, how he looks playing out of that spot. And then offensively, I'm curious to see if they, if, Kevin Porter Jr. and Jalen Green are able to continue building on what they did to end last season, right? Do they come out of the gate and they're just on fire and things look fantastic because they are very clearly the one-two options offensively? Um, or do they maybe come out and struggle a little bit to find their footing, right? To, to get back in the flow of where they were to end last season. So those are two of the key things that I'm really looking forward to this Sunday for the first preseason game. What about you, Ali Khan? What are you looking forward to? So the thing about Jabari you mentioned I want to bring up is if you go back and watch those clips and you just, in Jackson, you were at training camp, most of the time that we physically got to see Jabari Smith play, he was the four in those lineups, almost exclusively. So that's one thing I want Rockets um Rockets fans to think about our listeners is he's been at the foremost of the time in these scrimmages that we've seen okay number one so what I'm looking forward to is seeing number one what is the second unit what is the first variation of the second unit um Steven South will, will kind of work with that a lot how many minutes does Al P play in the first quarter before he's taken out what is his what is his first quarter minute rotation look like is he going to come off five minutes, six minutes in, and you're going to put put in Garuba or Bruno Fernando, who's looked good in training camp as well. W- what is that rotation looking like? Also, can, can, I make, can I make a prediction on that? I'm making yes. a prediction right now. Eric Gordon will start. I agree. And Al P is going to be the first substitution in for and Jay Sean Tate will be the, the the sixth man, the first sub off the bench, and then they will effectively go, go small five. with Jabari at this five. Yeah, I'm excited to see that because you know how I feel about that lineup. Um, I, and I think the, the next thing I'm gonna look at is defensively. Um, if you if you've been watching my boy Jackson's YouTube videos that he's posting from training camp, all and make sure you're subscribing to that channel too, besides locked on, he's been posting all the clips and you can listen to. Jonathan Fagan, our good friend, asking Steven Silas about what 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 is the change in the in this in the scheme? 
or he's asking Jalen and all these other guys. And they keep mentioning the concept of help. And I have an idea of what that means. We've seen a little bit of it, but I'm excited to see it in a game setting. And I'm excited to talk about it next week when we are on Lockdown Rockets. So keep an eye out for their defense and what Silas means by help. And we'll discuss it and break it down next week. And you know we're going to have you covered for all that action right after the game, all the all the spots next week leading up to our next episode with Ali Khan. We'll be back on our normal day. So that should be Wednesday of next week that you can expect your next uh, Ali Khan uh, pit stop episode. But Ali Khan, you know the drill. Let everybody know where to track you down at. Follow me on Twitter at Rockets underscore Insider. Make sure you're following us at Locked on Rockets. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, a lot of good stuff coming your way, man. You need to subscribe. Let me just give you a hint. You like telestration videos. You want to subscribe. That's all I'm going to say. And that's going to do it for another edition of Locked on Rockets. As always, appreciate you so much for checking out the show. If you haven't done so yet, please consider subscribing wherever you listen to your podcast. That's Apple, Spotify, Google, the Odyssey app, free and available on all podcast platforms. We're also on YouTube. Just go to YouTube, search Locked on Rockets. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. But as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. We look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.